to the cellar. Um, could be a lengthy one tonight. Got quite a few comments, so uh, batten down the hatches and uh, let's go. Last year I put out Twilight Fables, which was a book bringing in the original fae folklore from mythology into D&D. Because, like you say, most, day, most Fae and D&D are more Disney than it, that what they originally were. Brothers Grimm. If you'd like a PDF and hard copy, let me know. I even made it in an OSR version that you'd probably... For, yeah, I'd love... You betcha. Um, because I try to use Fae, especially in the wheel. I'm using the Fae more and more uh, <laughs> the way uh, the brothers found them to be. Um, next one. Happy free RPG day. Well, I'm glad you had a good one. Um, I don't go out and celebrate that day. Uh, I'm just, I, I stay home and I, I mark it. I came home with a decent haul, a lot of cool, lots of cool goodies. Of course, spent a pretty penny as well. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's probably something to do. It's, it's called fishing. They throw out worms that you like, and you come in, <laughs> you bite the hook, come into the store, and spend some money. And God bless you all. It's our, it's our industry. It's how it works. Um, not hard to do when your friendly local game store is pretty awesome. Hope you had a good one. All right. Um, I don't know. I may. Uh, I'm I'm thinking strongly about compiling a list of great friendly local game stores and I'm going to set up a set of criteria uh, one of which is going to have to be that they have excuse me there's a gnat that's bugging the hell out of me um, it's, it, I, don't, I don't have twitches um, <laughs> one of the criteria will be that they have uh, games in the store and uh, th that camaraderie that family feeling that's generated that only comes from gaming in the store um, thanks for another one. Me and the school kids. Oh, the school club kids have been doing one, one shot adventures once a week for the summer. Any recommendations on one shot or otherwise one, two session adventures? Well, yeah, um, they, they, they lend themselves well to the strange things going on over in that corner of the Shire and the, where you can just go over and have a slaughter fest. Um, Pack, you know, uh, some something, some something dangerous, but not you know so malevolent that the the shire is the entire shire is in danger. Um, you can do the kind of things. Um, you can have a lot of fun with being tasked with the group is tasked with driving all the wolves out of a large uh, forest, perhaps being paid by a a, a wealthy landowner to uh, rid his forest of all these wolves. And, um, okay, <laughs> you can get a lot of it. Well, I don't know how you want to do the experience points, but you could rack up a lot and have a lot of encounters. Can't shoot them all from a distance with bow and arrow. Wouldn't that make it so much easier? Um, run, performing tasks for... The uh, wealthy overlord, I need, uh, there's a wyvern over here, I need that cleared out. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a band of goblins raising hell down this part of the Shire. Um, go see what it is and clean it out. There, there's those kind of things, mini quests, if you will, that you can do in a one shot. Okay, off we go. You get down there, you're confronted by the by whatever, you know, threatening the livestock and stealing babies, whatever, and you wipe it out. You don't need a lot of backstory. You don't need a lot of uh, in, in explanation. Such and such is going on. Your task is to rectify this circumstance, these circumstances, this situation. Um, look for simple, because believe me, simple can be fun. You know, you don't have to just give them mop up, sop up uh, adventures. They can be tough. You know, this could be a tough band of uh, of uh, uh, gnolls that has moved into the woods and is you know, you know raising hell. Make the adventure commensurate with their abilities, 
Don't make it a, a gimme. Make them think for it. Make them work for it. But one-offs, oh, sky's the limit. Anything you can think of. See that in the, on the wall behind me? Well, there's a bottle of uh, some kind of weird kind of beer. Off to find this bottle of this potion of such and such. A row of hats. Find the, the magic hat of so-and-so. There's a little plushy owlbear up there. Go find the owlbear idol. They don't have to be real. When they're one shots, and what you as a DM are is doing are doing, is keeping the interest fl from flagging. Anything will do. And the more novel, the more fun. The more likely you'll hold them over the summer. You know your group better than I. Um. Fantastic to hear. Hold on. Okay. Uh, getting from hit points in to how hard to kill points took me a while, but it's now it's how I view it now. And in response to that one, how hard to kill points is by far the best, you know. And really, if you if you look at it from that from that approach, hit points make more sense. And we've got a couple others down here that will go into this uh, this aspect of uh, damage and stuff also. Um, okay, here's another. Yeah, I couldn't wrap my head around a higher hit point character being able to take several hits to the head. No. See, now you're getting into, you're, you're getting less abstract if you're going into hit location. Remember, hit points, or how hard to kill are you points, were developed in the simplest sense. No hit location, no critical hits. That all came later. This is the very pure essence. How hard is it to kill you? And as you advance, as you adventure, as you experience, you get harder and harder and harder to kill. Now we'll go on here. Um, it just didn't make sense until you view them as a more experienced player's un perhaps uncanny ability to suspect an attack is coming, move, or dodge even slightly. Still a hit to the head, but maybe just an, a glow. Or, all right, there again. Doesn't matter if you're going to use hit location. Even glancing hits to the head are not anything you can just poo-poo and dismiss. Can't do that. Again, you're using hit location and called shots in that. I don't care for it. I know lots of people do. But again, when you're looking for the mesh, how hard are you to kill points? Makes a lot more sense when you don't get into hit location. Now, if you as a DM, when some poor player character has just bought the farm irrevocably, well, then you can go into any kind of detail and explanations of how many limbs got severed and, and how flat the cranium was, you know, doesn't matter. Um, all right. This also kind of explains how some, how, somehow, how some hit points, the dodging and perception components of being hard to kill, regenerate quickly. Obviously, a sword or an arrow to the gut should not, and I always somehow thought that, so how hard to kill points works best for my brain. Good. However, it's not my favorite mechanism. I also usually choose or modify the game to be more grim dark when I can, Versus 50's tremendous amount, oh, pardon me, I don't have my glasses on. 5E's tremendous amount of hit points. However, to me, your reflexes, etc., are always reflected in your dex mod to your ar armor class. Exactly. Seems like we are stretching, and I just don't like characters that can take six heavy crossbow bolts to the eye, or a modern character who can take a multiple 50 caliber Browning 
or buried shots to the head. Well, there again, you're using specific hit points, specific, pardon me, areas, specific impact points, and you're using firearms. And this game was not designed to have any kind of firearms in it whatsoever. It was not designed for that. You're talking swords and spears and arrows and slings and shit like that. Rocks. Not a mod deuce. The M250, mm. no, 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 those, those aren't in here. No. Um, if you get a chance, go back and find an, uh, go back in an archive somewhere and find an old uh, article. I believe it was in Strategic Review called Storm Geschutz and Sorcery. <laughs> it's an interesting hodgepodge mix up. Um, let's see. Right, so you know, you're 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 using an abstract system with specific hit locations, and the one doesn't fit well with the other, uh, in my opinion. Encumbrance, yes, I remember almost completely ignoring it, since players want to just mostly mostly kill and loot. Okay. If that's all you're doing, it doesn't matter. I've used the cleric prayer. I like, no, I have used the cleric prayer, prayer, prayer idea allowing flexibility, and it's great. Being able to cure poison when needed and being stuck with it, if not, is a great thing. I thought, oh, I got to put on my glasses. I'm sorry. I'm having a long night. I believe it's the Canadian smog. We've not had any uh, blue sky here in Cincinnati in days. Um, it's 85 degrees, 88 degrees this afternoon and completely overcast because of the smog. Okay. Um, I also thought, how could that be used with magic users? It shouldn't be. Low-level magic users memorize the same combat spells Sleep, magic, missile, charm, and web, etc. every time. I gave the extra level of spells based on intelligence bonus, but they couldn't memorize the same spell as they did with their normal spell slots. This caused them to memorize spells like whole portal and read languages. And due to having them, they found ways to use them which would rarely, rarely happen normally. Do you have any, any other ideas like this to help facilitate magic users use the non-combat spells? Okay, um, you could, if you want to give your magic users a little more flexibility, allow an item, ring, bracelet, necklace, fob, whatever, that does something two times a day, three times a day, some low-level thing. And by allowing the magic user to find a couple of those types of things that do those low-level spells, um, sleep and, and, and um, et cetera, you, open, you give them more opportunity to use those other spells creatively. And that's one way to do it. The, the item can only be used by a magic user and if the other players you know, cry about it, tell them tough luck. You know, the, the magic users can't use the swords and the gleaves and all those wonderful, those wonderful uh, fighting, you know, aggressive things. I'm sorry, the, the gnat's back. It's the blue light I'm using it that's attracted to it, I guess. Anyway, um, that's a way to encourage them to think outside the box. If they have that amulet or whatever it is, and if it's normally a spell, 
that they could, you know, only use once or would have to memorize twice. Well, that's what this this token, this thing does once or twice a day. So they don't lose anything, but they're encouraged to look outside the box and find new and creative uses. I tell you, I have seen I one of the, I have seen more creative uses of speak with animals than probably Well, and I, there's not one that springs to mind more. And I'm not talking about speaking to unicorns or bears or stuff. What what people can do is speak with animals with a bag full of mice. Or or you know, a familiar or whatever and and the way the things they can do with that anything that makes the magic users expand and you might as a benevolent dm up, upon seeing your magic user come up with a brilliant outside the box application feel obligated to award a little extra experience and a little boost up toward that next level just a thought um okay wow asteroid dice mastodon bone dice that's pretty amazing i don't know how i feel about that i kind of revere both of those things so the commodification now that's a wonderful word there commodification of them like that makes me a little sad but i can see the appeal you auctioned your ponytail i wonder where it is now can you remember how much it went for? Well, okay. No, I don't I don't know where it is now. I don't know how much it went for. I also when I came out of chemotherapy and was all done with it, during chemo I had grown a really big long Fu Manchu. And so, um and these were this was always done for charity. Um and so I also I also uh, auctioned off the Fu Manchu one time for charity, and that that one got silly um, that night. They were running around these two big long, you know, wads of hair, and you know, putting them in their ears, and it it would it, 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 all over through the audience. People were doing weird things. It, that's the whole point of it. It's something weird. It stirs up the people that have been sitting there maybe for an hour and are starting to nod off because all the blood's pulled in their butts. And so I'm up there on stage doing something bizarre. Always for charity. Except for the Twinkies. Twinkies I might, I used uh, whenever I felt like it. But never, never for uh, personal gain. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, maybe some mad d, &D scientist is cloning me somewhere. <laughs> okay, good luck. All right, next, Chrome Dome Rat Tail. Take the ultimate revenge and stat that up into a monster. Dome-tailed chrome rats. <laughs> I might do that for Wampler for his uh, mutant crawl. Uh, thanks for experience. Thanks for sharing your experiences, Gen Con. Sounds like it became pretty impersonal and overcrowded. Central Station on crack. Yeah, sort of. And t today I decided, okay, enough of that crap. I hadn't had a haircut since the pandemic started. And today I went and got the ponytail cut off. I got it all cut up on the sides. Chopped all this, thinned all this out. Screw it, I'm in my w summer weight, minimal hair. Too much work for too little hair. So that's done. Um, okay, hit points, that's in uh, quote marks, make my regular players think of a character actually getting hit by a weapon, but that's not what it represents. Here's my alternative. I call them hedge points. Hedge as in I want to hedge my bet. It goes with taking a chance in combat. No, it probably won't stick. You might. You're right. Um... No, I, I think 
I really, I really think, and, and to be honest, um, this concept of harder to hit, harder to kill points is something that I've only recently come up, you know, only in the last year, year and a half or so, have has, it's coalesced in my head as the easiest way to describe them. Anyway. All right, next. I like how you talk about all the inside stuff. As far as hit points is concerned, I dislike one aspect. Player whose character has 100 hit points, or some large honor, might say his character jumps off the cliff because they'll survive based on the number of hit points and the maximum damage they could receive. I've seen similar stuff like this. The DM should either not allow it, or if they do, say the character died because hit points is the character's ability to stay alive while actively trying. If they jump off a cliff or something like that, foolish, then they are not actively trying to stay alive. That's a good rationale. I, I would not refute your rationale. I don't like um, what you're saying. I got 100 hit points according to the chart. If all my dice max out, most I can get 80, I can live. Ah, and jump. Once again, I, co I, I refer to the great one. Pardon me, Jolly Blackburn and the Knights. And with their ridiculous, you know, hundreds of hit points in that, um, he's made fun of that, uh, that aspect of the game also. Um, th there's, a, there's a fine line here as a DM on what you do when you have a player this foolish. For one thing, they're totally disregarding the um, the ethic, the ethos of the game. They're um, they're okay. It's a game that we use as much for similitude as we can, and they're throwing all that aside and just simply using the numbers. Um, oh, I, I can only take, maximum I can take is 80 points. I got 100. Uh, I'm going to do it. Okay. Um, if you have players like that, then if they want to make those kind of distinctions, you can make the distinctions on what the damage is that they get. And if their leg bones are shattered into hundreds of pieces, even if they're healed... Healed, you know, capital H, ooh, you know, light from above, healed, they'll still limp and gimp and can't run worth a damn. Bad idea, wasn't it? But hey, it's not like you're being unfair. If they want to be realistic, realistically, I can't die. Yeah, but I can take your legs and make them one third the length they were before. one way to deal with people like that. It certainly isn't in the spirit of the game, is it? And it's been my experience that people that play like that way outside the spirit of the game either ruin the group or find themselves outside the group. Um, and I agree, if they're not actively trying to stay alive, jump off a hundred foot cliff, you die. Period. Roll a 20. Oh, gee, a bush broke your fall. <laughs> you only had three broken limbs lying there at the bottom of the cracked rib. Um, it's just, you're, you're going so far outside the the spirit of the game. And if, and if, you, if, you, if, you, if you don't experience some of the spirit of the game every now and again, I really think you're cheating yourselves. I think the players that don't do that are ch cheating themselves. Um, let's see, there's another one in here that goes along these lines too. Gotta go back to the glasses tonight. My eyes have been really, they've been, well, 
they've been really irritated for the last several days. Um, darling, sorry for the unclear on that term, referring to ideas writers have that they have to sacrifice. Yeah. Um, no, I don't kill my babies to get it done because I'm doing something different, I think. I mean, I've written, I've, I've, I've done a, I've done a lot of uh, different writing essays and opinion pieces, and even a short story, and a lot of modules and adventures and that, and um, I can't remember any time I've had to lose things to make them cut them back to the size I needed. Anyway, um, yeah, the more ideas, the better. Um, Next one, I need some dice throwing time, but no, off to a union meeting, training, darn adulthood, yes, I remember, and I feel for you, my brother or sister, as it may be. Would you get scar tissue if they had healed with magic? Good question. If, if you take the more mundane idea of magic forces nature to do things faster or whatever, then healing would promote um, blood vessels to reattach themselves, um, capillaries to flush with blood, to bring oxygen to the flesh, wounds to stitch themselves together. Um, I I don't unless I I would make it two kinds of healing. I, oh, oh, and a, and another kind of a resurrection. Because now you you now you're not talking about magic surgery. Now you're talking about magic plastic surgery. Reconstructive surgery. You know, you just got your head half flattened by that uh, uh, huge rock that rolled over it. And, uh, yeah, they can bring you back to life, and you, you go through life with a, you know, half, oh dear, there we go, half a head. Or they can do reconstructive surgery, and now you have a head. That's your world, your, your, your call. And um, it's one that uh, it, it's a it's a ruling that probably wouldn't come into play very often, unless you've got a meat meat grinder kind of campaign going on. Um, but that would be that would be your call altogether. Um, and if you have to seek out a higher level, a more skilled individual to do these things, particularly in a, like a resurrection, well then. Okay, I can bring your buddy back to life, or I can bring him back, to, your buddy back to life, and he won't scare all the small children, dogs, and women in the neighborhood. Because I'll put him back together more or less the way he looks like he should be, as opposed to, you know, now he's alive like this, and that was where he was when the rhino ran over him. Um, it's an interesting idea. I don't know. I don't, I'm not exactly sure how I'd handle that. Um, but I, I, it's good thinking. All right. As the DM responsible for the actions of the forces of evil and bad luck, there is no reason not to have antagonism against the players. Okay. Um... We we may be we may have slightly differing um, ideas of what antagonism is. Antagonism, in in my definition, is having a having it in for you, for whatever reason. Um, certainly, um, DMs have friction with the players, and rightly so. But anyway, I'm nitpicking. I remember a party slew a small dragon and brought the horde to town on a large wagon. 
I explained to them that the mob they now fought to keep at bay from their hall was the same mob that the dragon had stolen from for years. <laughs> Brilliant. They were offended that they should share such a bounty considering they'd done all the heavy lifting. <laughs> yeah, a bunch of murder hobos. In the end, a compromise was made after I reminded them of their good alignments. Yes, yes, use that club on there and beat them with that good alignment. They chose charity over their own greed. The townsfolk would eventually come under the reign of one of the fighters once he achieved the status of the Lord, and they were loving subjects who remembered the player's generosity. In the moment, however, the players felt I was being an ass and trying to cheat and diminish their efforts. What goes around? Oh, what, all right. What comes around goes around. <laughs> I like that. I like that. <coughs> you, they, they, you, they're trying to steal it back. I've mentioned before that when, with that enormous un, influx of specie, uh, hard, hard money, that inflation goes off the chart. And now what should have been, at the very, be, at the very least, months and months and months of total idle laziness getting fat on rich foods, isn't. Um, is that antagonistic? No. Not, not negative, not negatively, not aggressively. Uh, if you're using the Greek meanings and go way back, yeah, that's part of the balance. Um, yes, the DM should, because he will have many opportunities to work against the betterment of the party. The DM is, after all, the bad guys, as well as the benevolent figure explaining everything to you and doling out goodies. Let's go on here. Um, I came across this question elsewhere and thought it might provide some interesting comment. Can the DM cheat? Simple question, or is it? To couch it further, is the DM position not one in which cheating with the rules is possible? Certainly. But, no. Everything we ever, everything Gary and I ever put in front of a book said if you don't like the rule, change it. So, that you can't cheat if you can change it legally. I know I'm getting semantics here, but... Uh, Let's see. Players may, may feel cheated of a decent fight if the DM softens up the monster class. Equally, they could feel cheated if the DM railroads the party by, say, not allowing, not allowing a roll for a locked door, thus frustrating the PCs from moving in that direction. But is any of that cheating? No. No. No, look, I'm not telling, I'm not saying that the DM's like the Pope, omnipotent. Can't make a mistake. Not omnipotent, infallible. Well, they are omnipotent too when you get right down to it. But I'm not saying they're infallible. No. You know, we're not the Pope. Um, is it a cheat? If you um, fudge a die roll in favor of the player, yes, no, um, you may have a, a valid reason to do that that you are aware of in the furtherance of the story and the plot unfolding and the future survival of the group, etc., 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 you may choose to allow an action to happen, though maybe it might not have, but you can choose to. That's not cheating. Um, let's see how to phrase this. The theory of evolution didn't cheat when it came up with the platypus. 
<laughs> Some people might think it took up all the loose bits it had around and made something out of it. Um, in the word, you know, cheating, the, cheating has a negative connotation. The word is negative. Cheating is to do something lesser than honorable or illegal or unethical. The DM is sort of above all that, those considerations. Um, the only way you could, you know, can, the only way you could accuse the DM of being unethical is if you had uh, evidence or strong, really, 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 really strong feelings that they are fudging against you, against the players. But how hard is too hard? And is that again? If, if I if I give you a really really hard obstacle, knowing full well that unless you think it through care, carefully, sixty percent of you are going to die, is that cheating? I'm certainly at odds with the group because I'm making it as tough to proceed as possible. That's that little friction point, that little pivot point that we all have in RPGs. Um, let's see, what's next? It's a good point though. They're not really, DM. the DM can't really cheat. Now, having said that, yes, the DM can cheat. The DM gets pissed off at a player, and uh, if, if it's a if it's not if if it's not a number that's sitting there on a chart, if it if it's an accumulated calculated number, base chance of this, and then because of that this, and the, you know, and the whatever, they can make it impossibly high, and therefore get even with the player. Because it's the players that they're responding to, not the player characters. And there's a distinction there that people need to remember. Um, <clears throat> let's see. <coughs> Here's one that's interesting. Which is better, writing, quote, elevated, end quote, and editing, sober, or writing sober and editing elevated. Well, for elevated, I just like the word <laughs> high <laughs> and still sober, straight. Um, seriously, um, if I'm if I'm writing my own stuff, well, writing high is much easier, much more fun. Um, if I'm editing either my stuff or other people, especially other people's stuff, no, straight, no, no, I, I'm, I'm not, uh, no, that's just, <laughs> no, straight. But when it comes to writing and creating, <laughs> woo hoo hoo, toot toot. All right, um, I'd like to ask you about player skill versus PC skill. Yes, everybody's favorite target. Our topic and argument uh, I often have for PC skill is my I I often I hear oh, I got to put my glasses back on I apologize I haven't changed anything here but okay um, my PC is the hero with high stats they should be able to figure this thing out even if I can't this person who says it's a valid argument. This person <laughs> says, no, it's not. But I, all right, the, the writer goes on, but I would uh, counter with this. It's a game, right? What's the point of a game? I find that when someone o overcomes an obstacle or comes up with a great idea themselves, it's far more fun and rewarding than rolling a dice. Rolling dice, they die. Uh, it also fosters players' investment into the game. Only when the players are completely stumped would I recommend going to PC ability check or whatever. Well, okay. Um, 
the person that's arguing, well, I should be able to know this, has forgotten the first letter in what we do. Role playing. Role. You're playing a role. Now, I have often, if somebody has a very high, a very, a very, you know, it's 17 or, God forbid, an 18 in a stat, then I have cued them, clued them, hinted them to account for that high stat. Not just handed to them on a planner, but made it easier to figure out. Now, the same goes with the guy or girl who's playing a fighter with an intelligence of 13. Now, keep in mind, average on a, three six, a 3D6 is 9 through 12, so they're slightly above average. Which, if you were a fan of the Lo Lake Wobegon tales, all the children in Lake Wobegon were slightly above average. But anyway, I digress. Um, and they go, you know, and the player is going to tell you, but I know that's what this is. But you as a DM got to say, yeah, but Boris here, I don't, he's not that smart. He hasn't figured that out. That's a pretty complex whatever. You all right? You, that, that argument and that, 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 that friction and that conflict goes both ways. People that, that, that want to be, they want to play smarter than the stats would allow. And then, on the other hand, having high stats and go, well, just tell me what it is. No. If your character has those high stats, that character will figure it out in character. But the DM doesn't have to just give it to you on a, on a dinner plate. Yeah, that, that's a turkey thing, you know. I'm smarter than my character. Yeah, well, that's fine. Um, Billy Bob Thornton is one of the finest actors I'm, I, I think, working today. And if you ever saw the movie that made him famous, Sling Blade, he played a man of very limited intelligence. That's what he played him as. Billy Bob Thornton's much more intelligent as he's proven in other roles he's played. But he played that role. So that's the role you play. You play what the PC can do, not what you can do. Sometimes that means the PC is smarter than you are. Sometimes it's the other. Um, but your other points are good about player investment and that. Very good. Um, you banned the 10-foot pole. Sad day for the lives of many a sham. I don't know what a sham is. Well, <laughs> only in the will of blame. And I don't really have to ban it. But it saves me time later when I don't want them to have it, telling them it didn't come through the transition from the last encounter into this one. Don't, you can't have it. If you never had it, you don't mourn its loss. <laughs> okay, now, I hear that the people I know over at the Silver Boule have a new uh, adventure coming out, kickstarting, rumbling up, down the runway, whatever, that uh, goes for the Weird Frontier RPG, which uh, that's a little subgenre that I've always... That is one of the few places where I could get into a little mild horror. As a rule, I'm not into horror, into the horror RPGs. But, you know, the skeletal gunslinger, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, I can, I can get, I've gotten into some of that. And um, so um, if, if, I'm, if I'm telling you the truth, then 
Um, Jim's going to tack something in on the end of this. Um, I think I've run out of things to talk about. Wow. Well, okay then. I guess I'll uh, see you next time. Dodada Gobi. Hello, and welcome to my song. He's the curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons. Now he's the feller, live from the cellar. Talks about D&D and old school RPGs. Still quite a feller, a curmudgeon in the cellar. Last man around when the race went down. Call it Gary in that Lake Geneva town. Hey Gary, it's an awful mess. Let me edit, we'll have success. D and D and Dragon Magazine. He's a curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons. Now he's the feller, live from the cellar. Talks about D and D and old school art. What the feller, a curmudgeon in the cellar. Magic missile, it's a mortar shell. Make it hit in the first level spell. Brought psionics to the game to attack that wizard's brain. ESR and fantasy, collection of micro armory. Tight with tramp under a tree, high as could be. He's the curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons. Now he's the feller, live from the cellar. Talks about D&D and old school RPGs, but he's still quite the feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. Still quite the feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. Curmudgeon.